The first Nazi book burnings were organized across 34 college towns by the German Students' Association. On May 10, 1933, some 25,000 books were reduced to ash. Within five years of the first book burnings, the Nazi government had outright banned 18 categories of books, totaling 4,175 titles and 565 authors, many of them Jewish. Among those works burned were the writings of 19th century German Jewish poet Heinrich Hein, who wrote in his play Almanzer the famously prophetic and profound admonition where they burn books, they will also ultimately burn people. As Roosevelt wrote in 1942, a war of ideas can no more be won without books than a naval war can be won without ships. The war of ideas he was referring to was that against the Nazi oppression of free expression. Under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, the Nazi regime, along with civilian followers, systemically banned and degraded modern art, music, and literature, especially those works stemming from Jewish authors and artists. In June of 1941, six months before the attack on Pearl Harbor, members of the American Library Association met to discuss a plan for a coordinated nationwide drive to supply the troops with free books. The ALA presented their idea to the United Service Organization and the Red Cross. The reception by both groups was enthusiastic. The USO wanted books for their reading rooms, and the Red Cross wanted books to send to military hospitals, remote camps with no libraries, their overseas clubs, and American prisoners of war. The two organizations decided to split the project's funding, while the ALA provided technical support. The military was at first reluctant to accept donated books. They feared that they would be flooded by unsuitable subjects in poor condition. Late in 1941, the Army and Navy gave their approval, and the National Defense Book Campaign was formed. The new organization was headquartered in the Empire State Building in New York City. The first board meeting took place on November 8, 1941. Althea Warren, a librarian from the Los Angeles Public Library, was chosen to be the national director. A week after the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, the organization changed its name to the Victory Book Campaign. Warren contacted librarians across the country to set up a campaign director for each state. Specialized committees were formed to handle different aspects of publicity, book collection, and distribution. External organizations were asked to participate, including book publishers, universities, the Boy and Girl Scouts, the Works Projects Association, and others. Books began to circulate to soldiers abroad in 1942. In the second year of the Victory Book Campaign, it was clear that the armed forces were in need of more books, but that quality over quantity should be emphasized, as noted in this poster and statement from the campaign. The Victory Book Campaign provided a valuable service to American armed forces and gave the public an easy opportunity to support the war effort. Two years of book drives provided a total of 10,290,713 books to a grateful military. The Victory Book Campaign was largely a success, but something else was needed. In 1942, U.S. Army librarian Ray Trotman and Army graphic art specialist H. Stolly Thompson approached a publisher with their idea to distribute inexpensive paperback editions overseas. They enlisted support from the Council on Books in Wartime, a nonprofit coalition of trade publishers, booksellers, and librarians who viewed books as weapons in the war of ideas. 
Between 1943 and 1947, nearly 123 million copies of flat, wide, and easily pocketable paperbacks were distributed by Army and Navy Library Services, free of charge, to U.S. service members around the world. The books were incredibly popular among soldiers. One Marine even stated that they were more popular among the men than the pinup girls. The creation of armed service editions made avid readers out of a generation of young men and helped to boost the careers of many authors. The armed service editions distribution of 155,000 copies of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby to the armed forces during World War II helped spur the novel to a level of success it had not achieved in the author's lifetime. To date, the book has sold more than 25 million copies. Another author who gained immense popularity through armed service editions was Betty Smith, who wrote A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Despite the story being a coming-of-age tale for a young girl, the book was sought after by many men serving overseas. Smith received many letters from soldiers expressing their love of the story and how much it reminded them of home. In a particularly poignant letter, quoted in Molly Manning's book When Books Went to War, a young Marine pours out his soul to Betty Smith, expressing deep gratitude for her words and crediting her with reigniting his confidence and will to carry on. Ever since the first time I struggled through knee-deep mud, carrying a stretcher from which my buddy's life dripped away in precious blood, and I was powerless to help him. I have felt hard and cynical against this world, and have felt sure that I was no longer capable of loving anything or anybody. I can't explain the emotional reaction that took place. I only know that it happened, that this heart of mine turned over and became alive again. A surge of confidence has swept through me and I feel that maybe a fellow has a fighting chance in this world after all. I don't think I would have been able to sleep at night unless I bared my heart to the person who caused it to live again. Publishers also received letters of gratitude from the soldiers, some expressing appreciation of a particular book or for the program as a whole and some desiring more to read after having received a recommendation for a good story. Please, just take this lengthy letter as a thank you for the wonderful book. I'm no literary person, but I like the book. I sit here in a dug-in, a blacked-out, command post tent at the front somewhere and write this in sheer gratitude. I've been meaning to write for some time. Sirs, I am writing to you as my last hope of ever obtaining the story Forever Amber by Kathleen Windsor. I have been told and I have read about what a wonderful story it is, but I haven't read it. I thought perhaps you could send me an Armed Forces edition of the story. I think that I am a quite discriminating reader, but I never see a group of council books without finding something very new which captures my interest or a worthwhile classic which I have long wanted to read. All I can say is thanks ever so much. Keep up the good work. As W. W. Norton and his colleagues at the Council on Books in Wartime had hoped, the Armed Services editions helped create a generation of men accustomed to having a book perpetually at hand, and who were exposed to writing for multiple periods, authors, genres, and cultures. As a result, the book industry boomed in the late 1940s and through the 1950s, particularly sales of paperbacks. The Victory Book Campaign and the Council on Books in Wartime took up the front lines in the War of Ideas, ensuring that freedom of thought and intellectual pursuits were to remain in the hands of Americans. By giving books to soldiers, the U.S. armed our men with the strongest ammunition in existence, the written word.